Welcome back to the Popperian Podcast and uh, welcome back to a returning guest. We spoke, I think, about six or seven months ago about Baconian induction. And that, um, as you might imagine, infuriated many Popperians out there, which was great. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, the structural problems. And I kept bumping into these two very famous papers that were written in the last three or four months through some you know, fairly casual reading on my own. I kept bumping into people making references to these two papers that were written in the 1970s, both called The Structural Problems. And particularly people like Ian Jarvey were incredibly glowing about them and saying they they put down a benchmark in the field and something very important that needed to continue. And uh, of course, they were both written by Jagdish Hadiangadi. So Jagdish, welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad to be here. Now, before we do get started and jump into it, you have a book which is edging ever so close to publication. So I should get you to mention uh, at least the details you have at hand about that now. So for any listeners, they can keep their eye out or know where to find it. Well, yes, uh, this is a book uh, called uh, Francis Bacon's Recipes, the Skeptical Recipes for New Knowledge. And uh, I'm negotiating or I will be negotiating a contract for it, which is a large publisher. So I don't want to talk about who the publisher is because I don't have a contract yet. You know, there's always a slip mm-hmm. between cup and lip. So let's see how it goes. But I'm looking forward to this because in some sense, it is a uh, uh, sequel to all the worries that I had in the 70s about methodology. And um, when it does come out, we must uh, chat again about it when it comes out in the near future. Um, but today, let's talk about problems and how it came about. So I, I might quote you just to start here. From the second part of your series, you start off by saying, the, st- the study of, log- of the logical structure of problems leaves one with a sense of unease. And then you go on to say, for several years, it made me hesitant to see these views in print. So what was it about... What was it about this particular topic that leads you uneasy and made you hesitate? And uh, and I believe it was it your um, dissertation under Popper as well. No, um, I did my dissertation in uh, Princeton, hmm. uh, and I studied with uh, uh, Grandy and Hempel in uh, the Department of Philosophy. Not with Kuhn, although I had gone to study with Kuhn. I did my uh, dissertation in Princeton, not at London. Mm-hmm. Um, and the dissertation that I wrote was on fire oven. And that has something to do with my theory of problems uh, because um, the way in which I approached the problems has to do with trying to avoid a difficulty that fire oven raised about um, methodology. So I can talk about that, but if you want to start with a quote, please go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to, yeah, I might start with that quote and, and why it's such an uneasy topic, why you um, you hesitated to get to, to write these things up. Well, let me begin by explaining that it's a failure on my part. I didn't have an answer to a question. Um, so perhaps I can state what the question is. What yeah, the problem please. is, I might say, you know, what, what I was trying to look for. And I still don't have an answer to the question. The question is, what is it that people see in a problem that a solution solves? In the most general sense, I was looking at problems as inconsistencies, logical difficulties. Seen from that point of view, what a problem solves is we get something consistent to replace the problem by changing something in the set of statements, in the propositions that uh, one is considering. But why a solution constitutes a solution to that problem is a is an issue that I still don't have an answer to. It's very difficult to know what to say about that. And for that reason, not having a solution to what you might say was my fundamental question. I was hesitant to write about it, but I wrote what I thought were interim conclusions, and those turned out to be mistaken. And so the whole episode about uh, um, 
methodology seen from the point of view of problems was a matter of great frustration to me until the 1990s, late 1990s. So, uh, so the uh, uh, the problem. I think if I had if I had been able to recruit someone who was uh, perhaps technically better than me, knew more than me, would work, uh, you know, could think more freely than I did. Uh, all this might have happened much more quickly. But it's not till the late 1990s that I began to see uh, where to go. How to? And it's not through. It's not me. As basically Bacon, who had solved the problems that I couldn't solve, uh, and he had solved only some of them. Some of them remain. So that's the background. It's a story of uh, uh, frustrated inability to get anything done. That's why I was reluctant to write about it. Well, that's I'm, why, I'm, mm, that's well, why I'm not published for a dissertation either. Uh, I might start with a, a question just for people who might be slightly unfamiliar here about why problems matter at all. Um, there are some great debates in the history of philosophy about whether there are problems or just pseudo problems. And one of Popper's great things um, was to highlight the importance of problems before you can think or build a theory or, or, or really discover anything. So um, what is the importance of problems in, yeah. One of them is, of course, Popper's uh, explanations, which are the form the background, namely that our theories are proposed to solve problems. Uh, but the, there are three features, which I mentioned in my paper on problems in the 70s, which led me to study problems exclusively. One of these is uh, the critique of by Feyerabend of methodology. In his book, in his later on in his book against method, at that time it was a paper called Against Method, uh, which I dealt with in my dissertation. And the problem is this: <clears throat> that although methodology is seen as, uh, in some sense, a meta discipline above all the theories, if you look at the history of science, methodology and science develop together. They don't develop independently of one another. <clears throat> and for that reason, it's not easy to say where methodology ends and where um, theories begin. So if you look at Galileo and the, the change from scholastic philosophy to mechanical philosophy, the requirements of what a good theory is changed as our, uh, you might say, our point of view about what exists changed. And so uh, it's very hard to draw a line between methodology and science such that methodology is independent of it. In the actual history of science, you hear of methodology only when one scientist, one physicist, let's say, is criticizing another physicist. And then the other physicist will respond using methodological terms. They may say, your work is ad hoc. Or one may say the, your, you haven't given a mechanical explanation of gravity and such statements, which are methodological in character, but they are closely related to the points of view that they hold. So if you look at the debate between Newton and Leibniz, for instance, in the Leibniz-Clark correspondence, there it's clear that they have different points of view and a different physical points of view, different methodological points of view, and the, uh, the methodologies and the uh, physical theories are closely related. So that's one reason why um, I began to think of a way of thinking about methodology without having to rely on a prior distinction between them. And so the idea was to study problems in such a way that you can get the methodology out of the problem themselves. That's one, you might say, motivation for it. The second motivation uh, is uh, that I, I thought Feyerabend, although he had discovered this difficulty for methodology, did not find a, a satisfactory answer to it. He suggested that we just switch from one 
the say the medieval point of view to the um, mechanistic point of view. He calls these comprehensive structures of thought, and you just switch from one to the other. But if you look at the actual development, it's not a switch. It takes probably 150 years. It happens very gradually. And secondly, um, if it's a switch like that, uh, with uh, incommensurability between theories and you know the, uh, a, a radical break between them, then all those arguments which take place in that 150 years from Galileo's, uh, from uh, Copernican uh, theory to Newton's uh, Principia will become um, pointless. And that seems to me odd because they, these arguments themselves led to the development of science for 150 years. And for, for these reasons, I was not happy with uh, the way Parabant approached the uh, actual development of science, describing them in terms of a radical switch, something which Kuhn also proposed. Uh, the, uh, the way we can put it is like this. Mm. If we look at science and ask, how does science progress? Just thinking of science as an entity on its own. That's a reasonable way of looking at it, but it doesn't answer one question. And that question is, how does science give us knowledge? And if you ask, how does science give us knowledge? We have to go back and look at it from the perspective of Plato. And that's really another feature of my theory of problems, is that I think of problems as the sort of thing that Socrates raises with his interlocutors when he questions them. And in fact, I mentioned uh, the Mino problem in one of my, uh, in my first paper on problems, not my first paper, but my first published paper on problems. Um, when, when you ask a question, um, when Socrates asks a question, it's a pointed question uh, of his interlocutors, which sooner or later generates an incompatibility between what uh, the interlocutor claims uh, uh, together with what he allows is true. Uh, and that incompatibility shows that the interlocutor is mistaken. And uh, I thought that um, um, Socrates is keen on finding out what the truth is about the matter. And he thought somehow that he could generate this truth by a process of questioning. It didn't come to him, but to his interlocutors. He thought he was like a midwife. He would, he would develop this uh, knowledge in his, uh, in his interlocutor's mind. <clears throat> now, uh, this question, how do we generate knowledge can't be answered if you look at science and describe it naturalistically, saying it just develops. This is the way it develops. That may be true that there are some features of science can be described in some naturalistic way, but that doesn't answer the question, why does science give us knowledge? Hmm. And, and the third thing that uh, motivated me to study problems, and it came from Popper. I mean, he's the one who brings forward problems as, as uh, features in need of study, uh, is the problem of the, the, uh, the discovery, you might say, of, the, of uh, pieces of knowledge simultaneously by different groups or different people. Simultaneous discovery, or what's called multiple independent discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the reason why this is important is because if two or three people discover the same thing more or less at the same time within a few years of each other, then it's an incredible coincidence that it wasn't discovered, say, 200 or 500 or 1,000 years ago. It was discovered just then. They must be responding to something which exists, which leads to the discovery. So if you take uh, Newton and Leibniz, who both discover the differential and integral calculus, uh, it's easy to say that one stole from the other or one um, plagiarized from the other. 
But then there is this amazing fact that something like a similar discovery was made in Kerala 100 years before that, or 150 years before that. And there's certainly no connection between the two. So That's, the question, mm, I just, and, mm. so what, and there are other cases like this, which are too far apart. There must be something about mathematics and the development of trigonometry and the development of astronomy, which together lead to a situation where there's a something there to which all three are responding. So that would almost add a um, a sociological quality to the to the problem itself. Um, so let's th let's th let's pause on on that last part then, because I think that's very interesting. And um, I think there's an interesting quote that you use somewhere in your paper, and you say um, we can um, talk about Newton and Leibniz and people like Russell and Frege and their simultaneous discovery. But um, if two musicians discovered the same piece of music at the same time you would assume that uh, it would be impossible or it would be plagiarism. So how does the, the how does the study of problems help us understand simultaneous discovery more, um, more clearly? Well, this was my hope. And uh, the idea that I had is that there must be something about the problems uh, which, uh, which develop in the, uh, in the world of ideas which are objectively in the ideas themselves, such that people, we are responding to it. If the idea mm -hmm. are like challenges, then we're responding to a challenge which is there in the literature. So it's a very social conception, but unfortunately, uh, anthropology and sociology uh, are not developed enough to be able to answer this kind of a question. So people today do study social anthropology. People do use sociology and anthropology for the study of uh, problems, uh, for the study of science. But uh, it's, uh, their efforts are like uh, using pre-Socratic theories of matter to solve quantum mechanical problems. They're very broad, general, uh, you know, talking about things like post-truth, things like relativism. Uh, and, you know, there's not sufficiently fine-tuned to explain something like why, the, why is it that a number of people dis discover uh, Russell's antinomy, uh, you know, of variations of Russell's antinomy, all within a few years of each other. So... Um, uh... How heavily influenced, I mean, uh, maybe that's the wrong way around, maybe it's the other way the influence was going, but um, some of what you're saying there reminds me of some of the um, historiography of Joseph Agassiz and how you, ha you have to understand, um, perhaps in, in this context, problems in terms of their history of why some metaphysical issues, problems cycle around at certain periods that the, we have to go beyond the logic and beyond the, um, the, 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 the obvious structure and look at what um, the historical structure of problems are. This is an issue that uh, concerned me at the beginning uh, when I began uh, the study of problems. I took up uh, Popper's view and Agassiz's view, both of whom have interesting views on the relationship between science and metaphysics. And both seem to be right. But if you put them together, they... Um, uh, they somehow negate each other. According to Popper, the scientific problems uh, and metaphysical problems are so related that the metaphysical problems have their roots in the science itself. He makes this point against Wittgenstein, who suggests that uh, philosophical problems are, problems are meaningless. And in particular, that bothers Popper because among the among the philosophical state propositions, which uh, are meaningless, are all ethical propositions. And uh, in the period in the 40s after the Second World War, uh, as the Second World War was going on, Popper was very concerned that the, dis the dismissal of ethics as an emotive reaction uh, was uh, somehow 
too kind to what was happening in Germany at the time. That there is something objectively morally wrong about what the, the Nazis were doing. And uh, he, this, he did not like the way in which naturalism relegated ethics to, to an emotional reaction, to a, you know, an emotivism. And so he criticized uh, Wittgenstein and he pointed out that many of the problems of philosophy are rooted in questions that arise in science. And that, he wrote a paper on that called The Nature of Philosophical Problems and Their Roots in Science. But then uh, Agassi joined Popper in the 50s in the, the London School of Economics. And between them, they came to see that metaphysics seems to coordinate problems in the sciences. Now, I don't know whether it's uh, Popper who initiated this or Agassi, or they got to this jointly. Uh, they don't talk much about it, but there was some tension about, uh, about uh, between them, they came up with the idea that the problems of uh, the problems that Popper was studying of a science are often coordinated by metaphysical concerns. So the Cartesians and Newtonians, because they have different metaphysical points of view, will study uh, problems which are, uh, uh, you might say, uh, um, these problems will be chosen because they are problems which arise for the metaphysical point of view. And Agassi's uh, idea was that if they're not metaphysically relevant, then they don't pay, no one pays much attention to them. And so uh, we get this strange situation that Popper rightly points out that many metaphysical questions arise out of science and therefore that the problems that uh, they represent are in some sense, proto-science. Sometimes they are not quite science yet, but become science 400 or 500 years later. So atomism, for example, addressed some problems coming out of Parmenides, but atomism becomes science only after Perrin's work in this early part of the 20th century. There's a long history there. And in all that period, metaphysics remains relevant to science because it is proto-science. But then uh, Agassi's view suggests that the uh, metaphysics somehow coordinates our uh, choice of uh, problems to work on. And it now becomes clear that you can't really explain science by metaphysics or metaphysics by science. These are, you might say, there may be categories which you can distinguish if you wish, but they don't explain one or the other. In the end, there's something else which determines why we work and what we do. And so my guess was that these, whatever it is that we are working on is the problem themselves, mm. not the metaphysical aspect or the scientific aspect. So I, I, I probably should have um, introduced this at the very beginning here. Um, what, why aren't in, I mean, very early on in one of your papers, you introduced the idea that um, problems are not reducible to questions. And um, this may be counterintuitive to some people. It seems like every problem you have is expressible as a question of some sort. But um, uh, I might open that up to you and say, what is the problem of, of considering problems as questions? Well, let's, uh, uh, let's go back. It's the word problem can be used to mean questions, or it can be used to mean uh, a difficulty. And that goes back to the Greek uh, of ancient Greece. But uh, instead of looking at the word, which is after all only a word, we don't have to, we can use other words for what we are talking about. Let's look at the uh, case of the Socratic questioning. Mm -hmm. now, Socrates asks questions and he elicits answers from his interlocutors. What is special about Socratic questioning is that in the process, he refutes the hypothesis or the uh, theory that is proposed that he asks people, he asks what is courage 
and he asks uh, General Lakey's to answer it. And when Lakey's answers, uh, he points out that that uh, the if he believes some other statement, then the two statements clash. And Lakey's even uh, gives up on his view. Then he asks Nicias, and Nicias does the same thing. So this, in this case, the question and answer is directed to finding difficulties. Now there is some there is something to be said about the way Socrates poses his questions, and I'm sure a series of uh, question and answer can tell us why it is. For instance, in some cases he's very adversarial; in other cases, the questioning is cooperative. In many cases, so Socrates, uh, in the case of the Lakeys, for instance, he's talking to the parents of children who want to know if they should study uh, how to be courageous. And so the two, the two generals and the parents of the children and Socrates are all seeking to find what courage is. So it's a very cooperative effort. There are other dialogues like the Hippias in which a sophist is uh, proposing some ideas and there Socrates is less cooperative, more perhaps, uh, although he sounds cooperative, is uh, more adversarial. And so you have all these differences. Now, all this can be studied from a point, a rhetorical point of view. But if we are interested in what is knowledge, the question and answer doesn't get us to it. To know what knowledge is, we have to follow the logic of the argument. We have to follow how it is that he gets contradictions out of uh, the interlocutor's beliefs. And so I, so although there are two ways of studying it, you can study um, Socrates as a generator of problems, and then of course the interlocutor gives answers. Um, the other way of thinking of it is that uh, Socrates is really interested in what he and later Aristotle called aporia, aporia, which is perplexity. And when Plato talks about the method that Socrates used, he stresses that perplexity, that uh, Socrates' method and his way of questioning is like uh, being stung by a, by a, a lamprey by a st stung by a stingray, I mean, mm -hmm. and um, that the stingray paralyzes you. And that paralysis is the problem that you face, and now you don't know what to do. So if we take that as the key to the understanding, then the question of the rhetoric of question and answers can be, can be put, to the, put to a side, and we can concentrate on the um, logical difficulty that he raises and try and, uh, try and see how that leads us to find knowledge. Now, of course, this is a personal guess of mine that the question and answers don't help. Mm -hmm. But I read through Hintika and uh, Van Frassen and uh, Sylvan Bromberger, probably the first to write in these. And I didn't find anything which helped me understand how we extract knowledge by Socratic questioning. Well, let me offer something which I think you mentioned in one of your articles again here, which is um, uh, you spend a lot of time talking about the importance of solutions, of course, uh, to understand problems. is it's, it's very helpful to first begin to understand what a solution does to a problem. And at some point, you take a very preparing line and you say, that a solution to a problem um, must not only be consistent as in ironing out any logical inconsistencies, but it must also have as much explanatory power as the problematic set of statements is trying to solve. So um, is that some um, way out of this, um, this riddle of um, why we are seeking knowledge or what knowledge is? It, uh, it does, but it's a, it's a frantic effort to find something. Uh, the problem uh, we face, the, the problems we face, are all logically equivalent. The difficulty is that a problem is a logical inconsistency, 
And you can't distinguish one inconsistency from another by looking at its logical consequences. This is because all, all, uh, all of them have the property of having every other statement as their consequence. So the question is, how do you distinguish one problem from another? And if logic and the, my first part, I wrote two papers, uh, two, part one and part two for the structure of problems. The first one, I investigated all the different ways you can distinguish one problem from another. And I don't think that it is possible. And for that reason, then I fell back upon uh, Popper's formulation of uh, explanatory power to um, distinguish them. The, the, think of it like this. Supposing I have a problem in physics, mm -hmm. and that problem is that I can't, that the theory of the moon, uh, the, the moon's motion uh, refutes my um, theory of gravity. I mean, that's Newton's problem, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And consider another problem, let's say in economics. Why does it happen that when people are saving more out of their um, say out of the income that the total amount of savings in this in the society goes down in the in this case of a what is called a depression you have two paradoxes two difficulties why is it that one of them is not equivalent to the other one is in economics the other is in physics so there must be something about the subject by virtue of which they are different <clears throat> so, mm. Yeah. So one way of mm. yeah, so please go. Yeah, one way of uh, putting that is to say that what we are trying to in economics is the following. That's the explanatory power, and what we are trying to explain in physics is something else, and that's that explanatory power, which is a, a question of depth. Is that a a, a, a helpful enough? cause that one is a, a deeper problem than the other? Or does this, uh, again, just lead us down another um, pathway towards some problems of our own? Well, this is now my uh, failed attempt to find a, a distinguishing feature. Um, if we say that it's explanatory power, let's let's go slow for a minute. Yeah. If you try and distinguish one problem from another, one way of doing it is by looking at all the solutions. If you look at the class of all solutions, all the statements which are satisfactory to replace it, but then the question becomes, what is satisfactory to replace it? It's easy to replace any problem with a tautology, which is either it's raining or not raining, and you go from an incompatibility to a statement that is true. Yeah. But it's not a solution to the problem to, let's say, Keynes's problem, why is it that we have depressions by saying it's either raining or not raining? So it's not just being able to replace it. So what is the condition that must be placed on the solution that it constitutes a solution to the problem we faced? Uh, it can't be logical. And um, so what my proposal that I tried to, uh, that I proposed in the second part of my paper is that <clears throat> we must think of problems as arising within traditions. So it happens, in, one is happens to be in the tradition of economics, the other happens to be in the tradition of mechanics uh, and, and astronomy. So these two traditions then animate the problem, and for the problem to be solved, to be solved, it must be solved in such a way that it's true to whatever it is we are trying to do in that tradition, that historical background. That's the historical approach that I take. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, um, and of course, the, uh, the solution then um, has to have, um, has to respond to something in the problem which reflects that tradition. So then I've, uh, I thought that what I could do, and that's what I tried to do in the second part of my paper, is show how problems uh, reflect a, the history of the uh, debate between different points of view in a subject. 
Uh, my, I mean, my very primitive idea was that whereas Socrates asked his interlocutors questions and showed they were mistaken, and that Plato records this, what happens in science is that you have two parties who have different points of view, each of whom is a Socratic figure raising difficulties for the other. Just a little more complicated than a, Socrat a typical Platonic dialogue. More like Mino or Theaetetus, in which uh, the interlocutor also raises difficulties for Socrates. So in this case, if we imagine our problems as arising in this kind of uh, uh, dialogue between two different points of view, let's say a mechanical and a point of view, which is Descartes or and uh, Newton's, which is not mechanical, not as mechanical as Descartes is, because he allows for the possibility of empty space. So you have two points of view, and they can then uh, lob difficulties into each other, attack each other. Then you can look at the problems that they arise later on as reflecting these difficulties that have been raised in the past, that they are somehow encapsulated within the, within the uh, difficulties. And therefore, to solve them, to solve the problem, is to find a solution to the difficulties that have been raised in that debate. That, that is my idea, that somehow uh, we get like a condensed history of mm. difficulties in any problem. And that turned out to be mistaken. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far, and I apologize for this brief interruption. But I will take this moment to briefly send out a plug for the podcast itself. The Popperian podcast is something that I've been planning for quite a while, and it's something that I want to keep running month to month. But to do so, it's going to need your help. If you're willing, or able, or interested, please go to the links below the podcast and support us however you can. It will be your help as listeners that keeps the podcast going and keeps the content coming out. And I thank you in advance. And with that said, we will now return to the second half of the interview. Thanks for listening. Uh, so I, 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 this might be a, a good moment to say, um, to reintroduce Paul Firearm and, and explain perhaps why um, uh incommensurability between theories if if uh, alternative theories and alternative scientists are needed to produce the problems in each other um what what's the problem coming from fire up in here i mean i i know in your paper you negate fire up and you say he misses some of the problems he misses the, the what um the fundamental way in which theories can be tested but he's he's he was he was incredibly prominent and still is in many people's minds. So why is an incommensurability a real uh, problem out there in the world? Uh, yes, that's, that's another paper I published, uh, for, which uh, called uh, the importance of uh, auxiliary hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And in that, I point out that uh, that in fact incommensurability is very easily solved just by looking at deduction without going into meanings in any uh, in any deduction in any uh, dedu valid uh, deductively valid argument there are expressions which are used in the premises which don't arrive don't come into the conclusion so if you have uh, let's say a is b b is c therefore a is c you notice that the middle term B has disappeared from the conclusion. Mm -hmm. That's a very simple fact. It's not nothing wonderful. And if you have a chain of argument, a chain of uh, deductions, then what you begin with may be a set of principles, which are a set of a hypothesis, a set of concepts and principles, which are completely washed out by the time you come to the conclusion. So if you take uh, something like the... Um, and uh, like they they say the origin of the of uh, the solar system, you have all kinds of hypotheses about, um, let's say uh, whether it's a hot origin or a cold origin, uh, and um, the example I gave is uh, if you now start deducing things, 
using auxiliary hypotheses, you will eventually get to a point where your test statement will be whether a shadow moves rapidly or slowly about what rate it moves across your visual field on the moon. Now that's so far removed from the concepts of hot and cold origin that um, there, is no, uh, there is no reason to expect that the whatever incommensurability there is between the expressions in the theoretical realm affect what you do in the realm of test. The only reason why Feyerabend and Kuhn are tempted by this idea of incommensurability is because they accept. Uh, I don't say this in my paper, but I can because I couldn't uh, argue for it um, without uh, much difficulty. Is because they accept formalism, which was proposed by David Hilbert. Uh, and the, the formalism, I don't think, is a viable theory of meaning. The, the problem is that Hilbert looked at axiom systems and pointed out that there are certain words like straight line, which mean one thing in Euclidean geometry and another thing in, let us say, uh, uh, in a, a Lobachevskian geometry. Mm -hmm. They mean different things because the, uh, the straight line is the shortest distance between two points, uh, is different for different Euclid and non Euclidean geometries. Some of them have more than one line between two points, some of them have uh, uh, infinitely many lines can be drawn. So the word straight line, the word parallel, these things mean different things in different axiom systems. So if you look at uh, science as an axiom system, then you can say that the axiom system represented by Galilean physics and the axiom system given by uh, Aristotelian physics are different. And so the expressions they use mean different things depending on which axiom system you adopt. But this picture of science as an axiom system is incomplete because when we test, we are no longer looking at a simple axiom system but we are trying to find statements which are in our everyday life, which you know you might say are part of our normal, non-scientific world. Uh, and in that context, we can test any theory in terms of uh, using statements which have concepts which have nothing to do with the theory anymore. We can wash it out by the use of uh, auxiliary hypotheses, mm -hmm. and for that reason, I thought uh, I thought that Kuhn and Feyerabend were basically on the wrong track, thinking of meaning change as a fundamental difficulty in understanding tests. Let's talk about um, the differences between intellectual problems and. Um... I forget the exact um, language that you use, perhaps standard problems or something along those lines. And um, this, I'm sure, will get you um, going uh, down some of your um, less Popperian lines, which I think are quite interesting. And this is so one of the examples you use is of a mechanic who's working on a car and he discovers a car in in his workplace that he struggles to fix or he struggles to understand properly. And you say, in most cases, he will come across the car, but he won't say that he has, in, that he has discovered some um, grand problem. Often he will simply uh, use guesswork to, of course he uses uh, some sort of guesswork to solve the problem before him, which really does exist. But really he's going to use some sort of ad hoc measure to do so, which is you pushing back on the idea. I think the phrase you use is we rarely look for refutations in, in our everyday lives. We simply tack on, as you were saying before, um, auxiliary hypotheses at the end of our theories and build them up into these grand um, clumsy looking entities. Yes, yes. Uh, th that was because I thought then uh, it, this is, uh, turns out not to be satisfactory, mm -hmm. but I thought that the um, what makes for a scientific problem 
what makes a scientific problem special is that it arises in a, in a context of disagreement. And I, I stress the importance of disagreement in science, whereas if you look at Quine and uh, the UM and Quine, they look at science as a scientific theory as part of a um, set of theories, all of which are in agreement with one another, they're consistent. And my point was that here that uh, when you are, when the mechanic is trying to, so to solve a problem in how a car functions, he can use a set of hypotheses that are all coherent in his mind and try and applies them. And he, he deals with it uh, as best as he can, given what he knows. But what happens in science is that because we have different points of view in the tradition, in that particular intellectual tradition, which are opposed to each other, they do not allow a practitioner or a theorist or a scientist, depending on whether you're talking about coons or fire ovens or whose point of view you take, uh, how you describe them. But two people, two scientists, will often disagree because they see things from different uh, points of view, which are within the tradition itself. And so if that happens, then one scientist will not allow the other scientist to get away with an ad hoc explanation. So that was my idea uh, about how it is that in science, in philosophy, the um, development of uh, the intellectual tradition with disagreements as, as the focus becomes the reason why problems are difficult to solve, why they can't be solved in an ad hoc manner. Whereas practical problems are always solved in as easy a way as possible. If you can solve it simply, you do it. And you don't worry about what other points of view may be brought to bear on it. That's really the difference between the practical and the theoretical realm that I saw. You take the Popper in line um, um, that uh, is very famous. You know, I'm going to butcher the quote here, but um, we move from problems to better problems, from worse problems to better problems. Do you, do you buy uh, that line that the new problems we have are better than the worst, um, that are better than the last one, and the whole process of progress is moving from problems to problems? Uh, I, I do in a way, but uh, I don't want to bring my current view into it. I want to talk more or less as a, or do you want me to? I'm not sure what you would like. Yeah, please. I mean, um, I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time slightly, but no, please, if, if you, yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's begin with my, what I thought then is yeah. that I thought, like Popper, that the problems themselves improve over time. Now I think that that um, that approach is doomed to fail. I did re I realized that towards the end of the eighties that it doesn't work. Several people criticized my views, and I mean Marcus Yonti in the, in the, the British Journal of Philosophy of Science, Tom Nichols he raised the question, and. Um, uh, Vlastos wrote a paper on the Gorgias, and Bill Bartley raised an issue. Mm -hmm. And those four things showed me that my attempt to find in the problems themselves their past history is uh, inadequate. Let's begin with a fact. Yeah. Is it true that all the problems have this kind of dialectical uh, history of conflict, of disagreement? behind it. And the answer very simply, as Tom Nichols points out, is that true in some cases, perhaps in most cases, but not in all. So in the 19th century, one of the issues that was studied, one of the, you might say, peculiarities of optics that were studied, studied were spectral lines. They were discovered by Wollaston. And the study of spectral lines is not related to a dispute in the history of physics. It's just an outlier. We don't know what to do with it. But by the time we get to the end of the century, of the 19th century, 
a lot has been discovered about spectral lines, and you know they have a whole um, science around it, and it becomes the uh, the um, Balmer formula, as it's called, describing it, becomes one of the uh, one of the great uh, successes of Bohr's theory of the atom that it can explain Balmer's formula. So you see, here is a case where what I thought was the case, namely that problems become richer and more interesting because of their uh, connection to a tradition of disagreement is refuted by this case. Uh, and then the second question, which very fundamental, and uh, it was Bill Bartley who came to give a talk at York University and he outlined the difficulty and really had no answer to it. And then for uh, several years, I was devastated. I don't know. I didn't know how to proceed. Um, and that that um, is a difficulty which goes as follows. When you talk about a solution to a problem, I, uh, and when you talk about a satisfactory solution to the problem, the whole task is to explain how we get knowledge out of it. Uh, and I thought that if we compared two tradition, two lines of a tradition, two points of view, mm -hmm. one of them will keep solving its problems, the other will fail to, and eventually we'll agree that one of them is right. That was my model. And Bill Bartley showed that that can't be right. I can't be right on that, on that point. And let me uh, describe what the problem is. Yeah, please. Whenever you have a hypothesis and a refutation, you have two propositions, two statements, two truth bearers, and you have no criterion for choosing which one to adopt. Mm -hmm. So my idea what then was, well, in that case, we do another test to see which one of the two is right. But then you are faced with four problems, four set of propositions, and you don't know which ones to choose. And then if you say we do more tests, eventually, you have a tree of tests which is developing out of the original test and you still have no criterion. But then I realized that the problem that I face is the old problem of the criterion which was raised by um, uh, Sextus Empiricus in his, um, in his uh, outlines of Pyrrhonism. Because you need a criterion to decide what is true Either it has to be empiricist or you have to be a rationalist or something and say that I know on the basis of some uh, point of view or the other and that can't come out of the problems. It I... must come from somewhere else. And I had no answer to that. I really didn't know how to look at the theory of problems to generate this. And the okay. third mm -hmm. thing, yeah, please. To... sorry? Yeah, please, please go. A third difficulty arose because Blastos, Gregory Blastos, in the 80s, did an analysis of the Gorgias in which Plato puts forward the view, Plato uh, through Socrates, studies the question, how can a method of refutation give us affirmative knowledge of a principle, ethical principle? And in that analysis, it becomes clear to Plato that you can't. Now he was wrong about that. It was wrong about that. Uh, I think now, but but um, that discovery of how he could be wrong, I didn't know the answer to that until late 1990s when I found that Bacon had solved it. Francis Bacon. That's my current work. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that the face of it to solve the problem, Plato in, uh, had to. Um, invent his whole metaphysical scheme to show how Socrates could somehow find ethical principles by the method of the Elenchus, by method of refutation. And that becomes the central question which I could not solve. How does a method of refutation all by itself give us knowledge? And I couldn't answer that. And it's only, uh, I mean, uh, it was a uh, 
I used to sit and think I, I had various ideas and so on, but none of them came to fruition. I couldn't actually get to where I wanted to go. And it's not until I discovered that Francis Bacon had solved it that I began to see light again. Hmm. When you mentioned Bill Bartley and his and and his criticism, uh, I can see where he was coming from only in the sense of I can see the debates he had with people like Agassi and other Popperians out there. So if you had two hypotheses and then four hypotheses and you went from this, there might be a standard answer of um, which one is more valuable, or which one should we choose? Uh, a criteria might be which one is more testable. And I'm assuming what Bartley was saying was um, you are already making an assumption that you're you're starting from a, a preconception that we ha must have criticism and criticism must be a, a irrationally accepted thing. And therefore, it all comes back down to a uh, problem of finding the right criteria again without having an irrational uh, uh, starting point. Uh, yes, yes. I think uh, I can see why Bartley was uh, um, why Bartley dis uh, found this difficulty. But it's a difficulty that can be expressed in another way, mm -hmm. which the social scientists find uh, more satisfactory. Namely, how do you get closure? I looked at it as how do you find knowledge. Yeah. Their question is how do you get closure? There's some sense in which the Copernican debate, uh, whether there is a, the Earth moves or not, it's closure with Newton's Principia. But how does it happen? And my theory of problems couldn't solve that. What about if it if it um in your work you draw these um great big branching trees of um problems and solutions, building up these intellectual traditions? What and again, I I, I can already see. The, the mistake you're going to say here um, that you're going to criticize your own work with here, the historical focus. But what if one branch, one hypothesis produces a much richer um, vein of thought and ideas and problems and solutions? Is that not, does that not intrinsically make it more valuable? Yes, that was my idea that somehow uh, in the progress of these, uh, the, in its development, you begin to see that one uh, point of view solve all the solves all its problems, and the other one fails to solve any of its problems. So then one becomes better than the other. But the problem that you have is what constitutes a solution to a problem. And I had not been. I, I still can't answer that question. So, <laughs> so I don't know the answer. How you would char characterize a problem such that? and a solution such that the solution solves that problem. And Bill Bartley's skeptical difficulty is that unless you make assumptions about mm -hmm. what is rich or what is uh, acceptable, which are extra uh, logical, they're not, they don't come out of the logic of problem, they don't come out of the history of the problem, they must be imposed by us. And that's Tom Nichols, who uh, raised uh, some difficulties, also points that out. He says you have to have constraints so that you can limit it. But your constraints are not knowledge. They are assumptions. And uh, you've just gone back to the same problem that you had with which I began. I've made, I had made no progress. So my theory of problems, uh, which I had great hopes for was frustrating in the end. I couldn't get to answer the questions that I uh, had. And I had one more difficulty, mm -hmm. which is my theory of problems applies to philosophy and applies everywhere. Why then is modern science so special? So there's something I was missing about problems and I couldn't figure out what it was. So then all through the 90s, I was actually studying particular problems to see what it is I was missing. And I studied uh, Bohr's work on quantum mechanics, and I studied Newton. I spent, I spent a lot of time studying Newton's theory of gravitation. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not as, uh, as good at noticing things as some other philosophers. So 
Uh, it was just too difficult for me. Let me offer another couple of thoughts. And again, I'm aware that you've you've mentioned these and uh, tried to shoot them down as well. What about unity? What a, what what if the the problem you're searching for produces a solution which um, um, is has that great psychologically satisfying thing of producing a uh, a unity across fields or across problems or across solution? Is that something that we should be valuing? Well, that's certainly a feature of uh, the unification. It's certainly a feature of problems. But that comes from, uh, but that is a trivial, for me, not a serious uh, thing, because whenever you take two statements, one from uh, field X and another from field Y, and they clash, the problem unifies. I don't have to do much to unify them. So if you take, I'll just give an example, you see what I mean. Mechanics mm -hmm. tells you, uh, gives you a certain way of looking at how bodies, how if two bodies are measured, the, they're traveling, they are moving with respect to each other, then you have a way of, of uh, you put one in a, uh, you can look at the velocity between them and calculate what would happen if a third body was placed. You have a transformation equation, so that if you know its relationship to A, then you can calculate its relationship to B if you know the relationship of A to B. In electromagnetic theory, in electrodynamics, this doesn't work because uh, the um, laws, the field laws, don't have this property. So when you look at uh, Newtonian mechanics and then you take uh, Maxwell's theory and you put them together, you get a clash. And this clash is then resolved by Einstein. So you can say Einstein in his special theory of relativity brings together electromagnetics or elect and the theory of mechanics. But what brings it together is the problem. So I didn't pay much attention to the unification as a feature because I thought problems unify. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I still hold that, that it's problems that unify, although I have now have a way of understanding how they unify which fits the, uh, the way things develop. Instead of unity, I thought what was important is uniqueness. Uh, and that's something that uh, came to me later. Uh, remember the, uh, I mentioned that uh, the difficulty that I faced has to do with uh, the problem of the criterion. How, mm -hmm. what is the criterion for truth? Mm -hmm. And this is what I've learned basically from uh, Francis Bacon, uh, although he doesn't talk about it, it's implied by his writing, which is that the problem of the criterion is soluble if you take a very small uh, uh, topic to study. You can't do it with metaphysics as a whole or with science as a whole, it's too difficult. But if you take a small topic, then you can create a set of puzzles, a set of problems. And this is one thing I discovered or I didn't publish then before I found Bacon, which is that when you have a, when you have a, a, a theory which has some problems, uh, say several problems, the solution to this, uh, to each problem becomes difficult because the other problems militate against it. You can, so if you have, say, four problems in optics or a particle theory of light or a wave theory of light, doesn't matter which theory, the, uh, the, if there are four problems, you solve one of them quite easily, but the other three remain unsolved. So your overall theory remains inconsistent because the other theory is solved. Finding a solution to all four is difficult. So I tried hard to find a way of stating the problems in such a way that the solution would be unique. Because a unique solution solves the problem of the criterion. Um, and the problem of the criterion being, how do we know when a theory is true? Now, the problem of the criterion can be expressed by saying uh, in the following way, we have a criterion for falsity. Whenever a theory is inconsistent, we know it's false. Then we know its negation is true. 
But usually that's not good enough because the negation will not give us a new principle. It will just give us a rather boring uh, fact about uh, nature and doesn't give us any insight into what we are looking for. So when is it that uh, we can study a problem in such a, or three or four problems in such a way that the four problems give us a unique solution? And I couldn't answer that question. And so in the 1990s, I gave up. I really couldn't, I couldn't get anywhere with it. Mm. And then I found that uh, Bacon solves it. What, what do you make of, if, I will ask you about Bacon again at the very end, and his solution. Um, but what do you make of um, Emre Lakatos in this? You mentioned him a couple of times, and and he adds, of course, he adds the element of uh, research programs and uh, research strategies to the whole um, element. And again, you shoot him down a little bit, and you say he has a touch of um, verificationism to him. He, he's, he may add something here, but he's also adding verificationism, perhaps a touch, touch of a um, confirmationism as well. Well, I mean, yes. Uh, um, uh, perhaps I was being unfair to uh, him, Lakatos. Uh, perhaps I was not being completely fair to him. Let's, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, his theory, uh, his theory of uh, uh, scientific research programs is an attempt to understand how it is that Newtonian, the Newtonian program survived for so long, um, despite the fact that people were critical of it. And he thought that the, he thought he could explain that because there's something special about Newtonian theory, which he later thought was true of all scientific research programs, namely, that it not only gave you a theory, but it gave you a way of answering your criticisms. And that's true of Newtonian theory. In Newtonian theory, uh, he, Newton's equations give you a way of dealing with possible refutations. So if you have an orbit of the moon, and let's say the moon, the moon's actual orbit differs from your projected orbit, by some uh, deviates deviates in some way, then then what is characteristic of uh, the uh, um, Newtonian uh, equations is that they tell you what you can do to correct it. You can postulate another mass nearby, or you can change the formula for gravitation. And this is not a joke because. Both were tried. This is not just uh, uh, in real life was imagining it. Both were tried. Mm -hmm. Some people propose that you change the law of uh, inverse gravity from the square root from the square root from the uh, square of the distance to a square plus the fourth root, uh, the fourth power from the square to the fourth power plus the fourth power, and then for some. Some, uh, not for all consequences, but for some consequences that works. Uh, or alternatively, you can suppose that there is some other matter nearby that interferes. And both these hypotheses are shown to work with Newtonian uh, form, uh, the Newtonian equations by Newton himself. He shows in the Principia how you can use both. Uh, to explain uh, difficulties, because the whole of the third book is uh, not the whole, but two thirds of the third book is Newton explaining all these possible difficulties and showing that in fact they're explained by the way things are. So uh, Imre Lakatos saw that there is in Newton's work something which already explains away the difficulties or some difficulties. It gives you, mm -hmm. you might say, a plan to solve. And he gen generalized that to say that um, scientific research programs have this two-step strategy. They give you a theory and they also give you a, uh, a procedure for dealing with difficulties. And he's right about Newton's theory, but I thought the generalization was all wrong. And that was just, I thought, just a peculiarity of Newton's theory that he can do this, that because of 
uh, the way in which the equations work in Newton's model. So perhaps as being unfair to him uh, for generalizing it to all science, because this is a valuable insight about how Newtonian theory works. When, when you mentioned um, uniqueness before, did you have something in your mind similar to um, like a preparing simplicity? I, I, I'm trying to connect Lakatos here. And of course, you use this wonderful example of the uh, Copernican revolution that happens in science. And you go into it and say, um, it, it had actually, the thing it was overtaken, the Ptolemaic view of the world, it actually become this monstrously large uh, research program with all these ad hoc hypotheses attached to it. And then and then Copernicus, uh, through some dissatisfaction with the messiness of it all, and all those ad hocs, had, um, uh, uh, add-ons to it, had come along and... Uh, Added, changed it all, fixed some of the, fixed the problems that he saw, and he had done so in a way which made it smaller, simpler, less less messy. He cleaned up the attachments. So uh, I'm not sure. Is uniqueness have any attachment to um, simplicity? No, it's a different uh, thing. Simplicity is how your theory is to be understood. Um, Simplicity is a criterion that is proposed by conventionalists because they can't say that the theory is better because it describes reality, so they have to find a, a criterion in the theory itself. So they say it's simpler, it's more beautiful, it is more elegant, it's uh, uh, easier to understand, easier to apply. These are all conventionalist criteria which try to find a, try to find a reason for choosing a theory, which don't talk about reality, because the conventionalists are afraid that reality um, can't be approached except by the theory itself. So you can't have an independent criterion for it. Uh, so I stay away from simplicity pretty much, or I should stay away from it. Mm -hmm. I sometimes talk about it, but. Uh, Perhaps I'm confused when I talk about it because the question of uh, the question of uniqueness is the following: If you take if you take a um, if you ask the question, are there um, any is there a smallest rational number in mathematics? Mm -hmm. You can solve the problem by saying assume that there is a ras smallest rational call it P over Q, multiply Q by two and you've got half the size of that rational. So you've disproved it. So if there is a smallest rational, you can find a rational which is half that. And from that you conclude, therefore, there's no smallest rational. Now it turns out that this, here, this uh, proof that there's no smallest rational or another proof which is no largest prime number and uh, another proof which shows that every number can be uh, uniquely reduced to uh, prime factors. All these are theorems which give you a theory of arithmetic. In the same way, there's no set of reductio ad absurdums that give you modern physics or modern economics or any other uh, subject which describes the world, the way in which arithmetic does the way in which we get for arithmetic. So the solution then is to find uh, some way of using the negation of, a, of, a, of a, an inconsistency to generate knowledge. How can we do that? Mm. And to that, the answer is that if you take a very small subject to study, very small topic, and you study all it's difficult, create a set of problems which together make it impossible to solve. Because every time you solve one of the problems, one of the other problems militates against your solution. So you can't find it. And then eventually you find a problem whose solution, whose natural solution, questions some assumption you've been making all along in the other solutions, some undermines it. 
And then you suddenly see how all the problems can be solved at once. And then that becomes a unique solution to that set of problems. This is what I suspect happened. This is what I say happened in the case of optics and in the case of gravitational theory, when Newton wrote his famous paper on optics and then the Principia, that he solved all the problems at once. And the problems constitute a puzzle. They're like a, a puzzle, but they only pertain to a small area of study. You can't solve, you can't ask the, the broadest questions that we have and try and solve them by um, this, this technique. And so science, for that reason, um, people have to specialize in certain very small areas and it progresses by making small steps, pieces of knowledge that we gain uh, in this manner, which was called the experimental way, although it doesn't necessarily involve any experiments. Let's um, go to Bacon then. So if um, that question you asked at the very beginning and a couple of times throughout the interview, um, what in a problem does the solution actually solve? What does it produce? Um, if it's not um, a, a, a matter of language, like uh, reducing a problem to a question, if it's not pragmatic or contextual within history or a social group concept, um, let's add the part of our bacon, let's add the thing that wasn't in your original articles. What... Um, uh, what 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 does Bacon do? What does Bacon add to this that clears up the problems that the problems with problems? The the thing that Bacon does is that he uh, treats uh, treat this prospectively. I kept looking at science and trying to answer it retrospectively, saying uh, I had a question. My question that uh, I couldn't answer is under what conditions would a collection of problems determine a unique solution. And this is a logical problem and I still can't solve. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what it is. Intuitively, I can see that um, Newton saw that the only way you can solve the problem of the planets and of the comets and of the um, tides is by assuming a law of principle of gravity working in empty space. He saw that. And people who objected to empty space or objected to something couldn't find an alternative. Leibniz tried and various other people tried putting forward, uh, um, Christian Huygens tried, you know, putting forward theories of uh, motion and gravity that would explain the solar system in some other way, but you can't do it. And it's not until Einstein came along that an alternative could be produced. And to do that, he had to give up the idea that we live in a Euclidean world. He had to assume a non-Euclidean geometry to get an alternative. So you see that the uniqueness of Newton's, uh, the presumed uniqueness, he was mistaken that it was unique, but it looked unique. Nothing else would solve the problem. This is, I think, the key to understanding it. Uh, why is it that Newton's theory is so um, definitive? Why is it that, that the Copernican debate began, which began with Copernicus, ends with Newton, is because he finds a solution to all the problems to which nothing else will apply adequately. Nothing else solves the problem adequately. He does. And that's because the puzzle which constitutes the Copernican debate is resolved by Newton's theory. And what Bacon brings to the, uh, to the uh, discussion is how to address the question of what constitutes a satisfactory solution. Mm -hmm. What he does is to say, that you keep building a natural history, an experimental and natural history, namely keep building the puzzle until you find the solution. So you don't have to specify what constitutes a solution. You know it when you find it. Isn't that a bit of a cop-out? I imagine people listening might be saying, 
um, if you know it when you find it, um, um, it, it it's it's sort of a, a a a reliance on intuition again, as in we don't need to ask the question of what the solution is. It's somewhere already inside you. No, that's the, that's one way of putting it. But what he does is give a social solution. He says that there are some people. He he talks about some the House of Solomon, mm-hmm. and in the House of Solomon, some people are constantly generating experimental difficulties about a particular topic, and there are other people who are reflecting on this growing uh, collection of this growing uh, experimental and natural history who try and work out what it is about the thing we are studying such that these difficulties arise exactly as they do. And uh, as long as if you have multiple solutions to it, then it's not satisfactory. So you have to find more facts, more uh, troublesome facts. But when you have enough of them, then of course you can interpret the history to find out what is really the case. But if you're worried that what we have, what we think we've found out is merely a figment of my imagination, there's a test to see if it is so. He shows how from a study of the discrepancies, we can generate power over nature. We can find out how to manipulate the thing we are studying in new ways which we couldn't do before. So now all of a sudden, the model or schematism that we have developed for the study of discrepancies in nature, for the study of contradict problems and puzzles, becomes a means of manipulating the thing in a new way that uh, was formerly not available to us, a mm-hmm. new power of nature. So that's Bacon's view. And the key to it is social. The reason why you don't try and solve that problem of what constitutes enough is that you have two groups, one group which is constantly preparing difficulties and another group of theorists who study what they're doing. And when the, when the group which is studying what they're doing finds an answer which is unique to the problems they're creating, then everybody relaxes and moves to the next problem. And if they don't find a unique solution, if they'll say there are two or three, then you have to continue working. You have to find what I call phenomena of the finger post or crucial experiments, as Newton calls them. You have to find something which refutes one of the, if you have two hypotheses, you can explain it, then you find an experiment which refutes one and doesn't refute the other. Mm -hmm. And then you get uniqueness. So uh, Bacon's solution is social. And he proposed when he was alive, no one would listen to him, that there should be a government department for science, for discovery. And he would organize it in such a way that people would, some people would do experimental work and other people would do theoretical work. I must ask you, um, there's so much more to ask, but I, I, I've kept you much longer than I promised I would already. But I must ask you one last question. And um, there's, uh, and again, another famous Popperian quote that I'm going to butcher because I don't have it at hand. And this is about finding problems and falling in love with them and then finding another. And um, just from a personal standpoint, for you yourself, um, have you found this to be true, that incredible meaning is found in life, perhaps all of meaning is found in life by discovery of a problem and your ability to fall in love with that problem until you've solved it in whatever in whatever way that is satisfying and then finding another. Is that is do 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 problems in your estimation fill our lives with meaning? I think it's true for intellectual purposes when people study theoretical uh, issues. Uh, intellectual problems, that they take over your life in that way. I think that's true. But I wouldn't say it's falling in love with them. Most of the time you hate it to the extent that I have experienced anything. It seems so frustrating that after 50 years, I can't even solve what I began with. So, I mean, it's uh, I would fall in love with it if 
in addition to Bacon's partial solution, I could solve the rest of it. But it's frustrating, and I can't say I fell in love with it. I mean, you could mm. say I'm addicted to it more than fall in love with it. Addiction says something, though, doesn't it? It means yes. there's something, there's some value there that keeps bringing you back. Yes, yes, that it does. Yeah. You can't shake loose of it. Mm. It's not that I have a problem. The problem has me. Yes. <laughs> um, that is, of course, an absolutely wonderful place to leave the podcast on. Again, I must thank you for your time. I've kept you much longer than I promised, like I said. Um, and, of course, we must do this again at some point when your book comes out and we can talk in more depth about um, bacon again. Um, Jagdish Haryangari, it is such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.